the King of kings and Lord of lords. Let's open a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege to be Christian. Father, we thank you for your truth. And uh, Father, we pray that it be a blessing and edification to the Christians that will hear this and learn from it. And uh, fear you, but love you, and seek your return. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, I, I like the way this is written probably my flesh, because the Bible's a spiritual, supernatural book, and I'm a carnal creature. But every time I read this scripture verse, it's always kind of reminds me of like, wait till your father gets home. <laughs> it's, uh, which in his times shall show you who is the blessed and only potent, the king of kings and lord of lords. Now, uh, it's wonderful to see blessed in there, because uh, God in his goodness and his blessings, but he's, he, he's that combination of uh, righteousness and uh, peace, mercy, and truth, and it's perfectly balanced in the narrow way of godliness and righteousness. So it's letting you know uh, the earth is filled with 7 billion people, of which a small remnant give respect and true worship to the creator and savior of the world. A lot of phonies out there, a lot of false preachers, false teachers, even uh, saved people that don't study their Bible, don't really know God, uh, are led by their emotions rather than God's truth, and emotions is what's killing the church today rather than truth, which would revive it. The truth should make you free. God's work is about a revelation of truth, and um, all the truth the universe has ever known, the truth should make you free which in times he shall show who is the blessed and only potent. Now, men have been given a free will and temporarily, uh, temporarily rule the earth. And as for the most part, completely neglected his creator, redeemer, and sustainer to his own demise at the revelation of the Almighty. And so it's talking about his return. And I saw heaven open. That's going to be quite a sight. And behold, a white horse. He that sat upon him was called faithful and true. There they are, faithful, true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. So this is what it's talking about, which in his time shall show thee blessed only potent, okay? King of kings and Lord of lords. And it's showing God in his uh, righteousness coming back. The first time he came back as a lamb, now he comes back as a reigning potent king. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, because he's, he's the ultimate of authority. And he had the name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And he's coming back to, to enact vengeance on the wicked. Uh, the retribution is coming now. Those who have sinned and thought they had gotten away with it, those that have despised him and rejected him are now going to give an account to him, and there's no price that can buy you out of his righteous indignation except the precious blood of Jesus Christ. When you see in his return the righteousness of judgment in truth, and further, and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. Now, if you're a saved, born-again Christian, you're coming back and following him. Clothed in fine linen, white and clean, because he gave you his righteousness, and white linen is the righteousness of the saints. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And yet on his vesture and on his name, uh, as I, a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And why the rod of iron? Because man has a propensity to rebellion. The Bible says rebellion is a sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is iniquity and idolatry. And the rebellion is against God. I was speaking about uh, rock music today. And the theme in rock music is always this... Uh, it, 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 it's, it's kind of a filthy and wicked way they say it. Stick it to the man. Well, the man is God. And, and it's, it's a uh, disdain 
and his authority and his goodness and his righteousness and his truth and his revelation. And, and that's the problem with the whole thing with the rock beat and the rock music. It, it, it's to uh, rise up and play rather than to be uh, godly and obedient to the king of kings. And uh, you'll find this took place when Moses came down off the mount. And uh, Joshua thought it was a sound of war in the camp, but it was not a sound of war. They were playing the rock music. Uh, rock music isn't new. Their rock, though, is not as our rock. Their rock is the rock of rebellion. Our rock is the rock of obedience. Theirs ain't the difference. Of course, you find it again with Nebuchadnezzar. At what time you hear uh, the music, the sound of the uh, harp and the sackcloth and, and all those different uh, musical instruments, they were being tuned to a different beat and a different drum. In fact, um, I can remember there, and everybody hears the rock music. You can't escape it. In fact, I listened to it and loved it uh, for the first 24 years of my life. I was lost as a goose in a snowstorm. And... Um, that was the uh, one of the songs that uh, uh, we walked to the beat of a different drum. And that's the truth if you're a Christian. Uh, their rock is not as our rock. It's a stark difference. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he shall smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron and tread up the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And of course, there's a lot of screwballs, and they don't live long once they start getting carried away with themselves. Uh, the last one was Gaddafi. Uh, that poor megalomaniac was uh, trying to make himself King of Kings and Lord of Lords of Africa. And uh, it didn't last long. And you get him, Nero, and Caesar, uh, and men get, and you got one that's going to come. And what a short reign. When you, when you think of life, and then you think of eternity, and you think of all the potentates and kings that have existed in time, uh, the Antichrist, the willful king, has seven years. That's a short time. That's how monstrous his reign is, and how uh, blasphemy is to God. And God gives him seven years to repent, and he does it. The Lord returns. You say, how long is uh, God's reign? Because he rules in light and in truth, and there's no shadow of turning. A, a God that cannot lie, um, a, a living God of pure holiness and righteousness. That's what the Bible reveals to us. A potent is an oriental ruler who possesses great power or sway. A prince or a sovereign, an emperor, or king, or monarch who has absolute rule over the people as all powerful one. And there's been only a few men that have really achieved that. Nebuchadnezzar was one of those individuals. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar had almost a complete godlike power. Most rulers um, find restrictions on their power. Uh, in the United States, the power of governing is divided into three groups and really diffuses it. You have a president, that's one-third. You have the, uh, the um, Congress, the House and the um, Senate, which is one-third, and the Supreme Court, which is one-third. Now, we're in a real difficulty today because five to six of the Supreme Court justices uh, need to go to the remedial English classes and learn to read English. They can't understand rules. They're making rulings that um, uh, are in incoherent with uh, the English of your Constitution. Uh, it's awful. Uh, the educational system in America is really uh, messed up. Because, uh, and uh, that's messing up the country. And uh, the president can't read the Constitution, and the Congress doesn't even know it exists. And so America's in troubled times. And that's too bad, because um, we had a wonderful republic. If you study the um, Bible, you'll find that a republic um, is God's form of government, and then the people chose a monarchy, and then the Lord sent 
uh, to straighten that out, the Lord sent his son to be the king of kings and lord of lords. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. Now, God and God alone, and this is a scripture verse that you ought to really meditate on. The thing that's sad today for Christians is it takes many years to learn the Bible. I've been studying the Bible for 40 years. You certainly will not master it in a lifetime. I see new things. It reminds me of things I've forgotten. And it's a glorious book. It's an eternal spiritual book uh, that has the words of God in it. And it um, is very important to study have devotions with it, but then after you get to know the Bible, what's even more important is to get to know the God that wrote the Bible. Now, people have a lot of concepts about God. I show you a distinction between God, Satan, and men. Deuteronomy, the power of the Almighty. See now that I, even I am he, and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive. Note that God can kill and God can make alive, can resurrect. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. Neither Satan nor men can make alive. Neither Satan nor men can heal. Doctors learn an art of promoting healing, but healing takes place with God. That's why you ought to always pray when sick. Uh, you ought to pray and then see your doctor and then pray again. Because all a doctor can do is bring natural elements to your body or processes to help your body promote its own healings through God. And if God doesn't do that, you're going on to meet your reward. I kill and I make alive. I kill and I make alive. That's the God of the Bible. That's the Almighty. That's the true and only Pope, King of Kings. And very, very soon, the world, shocked, will meet him. And I can't wait, because I want to see him. For as much then as children are partakers of the flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, and that through death he might destroy him that hath the power of death, that is the devil. Now, that's what men and Satan revel in. I can harm, I can hurt, I can beat you up. Uh, you talk about a childish, proud, uh, 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 way people are. They, they revel in their ability to hurt. How about your ability to heal? How about your ability to make alive? Well, we don't have that. And so he's so egotistical because Satan says, I will be like the most high God. I will exalt my throne above the clouds, above the stars. I will be like the most high. And there's another place where God says, thou art a man and no God. And uh, it, it's just pathetic, the pride of human nature. folly and foolishness of man and his pride. Now he can uh, thump his chest and I'm going to do, and nine times out of ten he can't even do that. Uh, there was a group in the book of Acts uh, they got upset with Paul. They were very angry with the apostle Paul. And so they took a vow on him that they wouldn't eat till they killed Paul. It must have been a wonder diet. I mean, I'm surprised somebody, they don't have that on TV now. Here, here how, here's how to lose weight. Determined to not eat until you kill somebody. But if you kill somebody, they're going to arrest you and put you in jail for the rest of your life. I mean, it's, you know, they didn't ever, they never got to kill them. That's the way uh, people are harming, hurting. And the real truth of it is, a real Christian learns to live and desires to hurt. I don't want to hurt anybody. I want to give people the truth, that may hurt them. I want to, I want to tell people what's right, that may hurt them. But that's their own fault because that's the pain 
like the pain that comes from lifting weights, the pain that requires to gain. But uh, people want to be vengeful and, and get even and, and settle the score and, and put other people down and destroy them and hurt them. That's the devil in the flesh. You don't want to be like that if you want to walk with God. God alone is life, and he is eternal. Then there are those who are in dwelt of God. They have eternal life abiding in them. So, back to the verse, who only have immortality, dwelling in the light. No one, no person or thing is immortal but God. <laughs> it's amazing how people are. Um, you, you watch uh, TV. I remember when I was a young kid, uh, I used to have Baron de Moen. I used to have all these uh, uh, D- rated uh, monster movies, you know, where they had the little claymations that be the monster, and it looked so pathetic, and uh, I remember staying up late to watch those movies, and Keltiki, the immortal monster, it gets killed. <laughs> well, how can he be immortal if he gets killed, you know? I mean, sounds pretty mortal to me. God is immortal, dwelling in the light, which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen nor can see. To whom be honor and power and everlasting. Amen. Boy, do the heretics go crazy with verses like this to their lack of understanding of spiritual things. Because they say, well, then the Lord Jesus Christ can't be God because we could see him. No, no. What you don't understand, God is a spirit. And no man has ever seen the spirit of God. But Jesus who was indwelled with the Spirit, whom God gave the Spirit without measure, was a man that had God's Spirit. He was the God-man. And so when you saw the Lord Jesus Christ, you saw God. Now Moses got to see the hinder parts of God, but you cannot see God because he's a Spirit when you talk of the Father. And this gets us into some things that are, uh, I don't know, I just have an understanding of, but I don't know. And I'll show you, it makes sense in just a minute. God is immortal as an eternal spirit. He's the Alpha and the Omega. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot to God? Now that's where you'll have your eternal salvation through an eternal spirit eternally keeping you. Offered himself without spot to God to purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. This Now there, real conversion and real um, Christianity is serving God. And what people want today is for God to serve them. It's amazing, but take a look at your prayer life. How many times you get down on your knees, and I do, I do. I, I, the Bible says you have not because you ask not. And I ask God for everything. I, I'm selfish in that. I get down, Lord, will you do this? Will you give me this? Will you give me this? But when do you ever get down there and say, Lord, what would thou have me to do? What can I do to please you? What can I do to serve you? And that's the prayer life that God's looking for. Now, God's good. He'll answer your prayers when it's in his will. But don't ask God to win the lotto. If you win the lottery, that won't be of God. That's not in his will to do things that way. That's the way of the sluggard. That's not the way of godliness. And, and, and say, well, I prayed and I won. Well, I'd be concerned about that, you know. Uh, that money will probably destroy you probably destroy your Christian walk. Uh, things that are gained wrong do not bless or edify. There's nothing wrong with godly gain. We'll cover that later on in the Bible study tonight. God is a, uh, immortal. Okay? Now the spirit of God is not easily discernible or perceptual to the natural man. For the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him. See, all he can see is this life. All he can see is the flesh. Uh, he can't see. 
soul. Now you take um, human beings looking at one another with lust. They see flesh that looks desirable. They look at the flesh. They don't realize that within that flesh is a living soul that can hurt and be hurt and suffer and cry and be defiled. They only think about those things. They, they only look at the flesh. Well, it's the same thing with God. They don't, they, the, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. That was Esau's problem. All he ever worried about was his belly. Now, if we're honest, a lot of us uh, are preoccupied with getting our three meals a day. I, I certainly haven't missed much. I'm not going to. I'm not going to be a hypocrite and tell you that I, I am a man of flesh as you are. On the other hand, we need to get out of that mode and get into thinking about spiritual things and God. For well, the natural man, and you're not spiritual if you if you're successful. It's for the natural man. That's not what spirituality is. Gain is not necessarily godliness. The Lord likened the spirit to the wind for your perception. When Nicodemus came to the Lord, he didn't understand spiritual things. And the Lord told him, he said, The wind bloweth where it lists, and thou hearest the sound thereof. It cannot tell whence it cometh, and whether it goeth. So is every one that's born of the spirit. And so the spirit is not easily perceivable or perceptible by the carnal creature. But you can hear the sound of the wind, you know. But when you hear that sound, it's like, well, is it there? Does it come over there? Is it there? You can't tell where it comes from, but you hear it as the wind moves. And you can sense the spirit if you settle down and listen. The spirit can especially through the Word of God, speak to you. I've had supernatural times that I've read that Bible. And as I read the Scriptures, I can almost, not really, I can almost literally hear God speaking to me. Because the Scriptures, the Spirit, will speak to my soul. There was a time I was going to do something rash. And I was reading the Scriptures. The Spirit of God spoke to me in the Scriptures, preventing me from doing something that would have, would have marred my life for the rest of my life. And God spoke to me and said, As dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor, so does a little folly him who is in line for reputation wisdom and honor. And God was saying, You go and do that. I can never use you. I'm not going to tell you what it was. You say, why is that? It's none of your business between me and God. But I will tell you this, I didn't do it. And that's what you want to learn, is to listen to God and not do what God tells you not to do. But people today are following their emotions. And you're a fool. God didn't give you emotions to follow. He gave you emotions to love your children with or love your spouse with. People need the emotional uh, effect of other people. But you need a sound mind to serve God and walk with God. You need, you need an objective, rational mind that listens to the scriptures, receives them, and obtains wisdom, the choice of all lens, and understanding the relationship of things, and to act appropriately by the leading of the spirit through the scriptures. You've got Christians today pushing their motion. And, and, and I'm talking about fundamental Christians. And they deceive themselves. They think they are spiritual because they're following their feelings. And they're not doing anything different than a cultist or a charismatic. Though they're saved. Because they become sensual. They don't study their Bible. 
I find it deplorable. You go around, why don't you say anything for the King James Bible? Can you quote anything out of it? Have you read it from cover to cover? You, you know about the whole group of people that fell into the pit, don't you? You, you know about the prophet that had to walk three years making the barefoot. You can give me, tell me what book that just came from. You know about the prophet whose wife died, and the Lord said, don't you cry for her. I'm going to take the glory away from Israel. Just as you lost your wife, you love her, that's all you care about, while Israel's losing their glory. And uh, you're, not to, you're not to mourn for it. You know about the prophet that uh, was told to marry a wife, or marry the wife of hoarders, so he could be an example to the people of how the people were to God in their hoardings, their spiritual hoardings, and their physical hoardings to the Lord. You know all that. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, chapter and verse. Uh, 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 is that Ecclesiasticus? Uh, no. See, nobody's reading their Bible today, and they all think they know what they're doing, and they're nuts. They're delusional, they're deceived. God says, obey my voice. You say, where do I hear the voice of God? From the book of God. The Spirit of God, I'm going to show you some things today. I'm not a physicist. I wish I had a lot stronger knowledge physics that I had. All I had was a high school course. <clears throat> a lot of people take a high school course in physics. Sir Isaac Newton was a saved, born-again physicist. He's the father of the physicist. <coughs> the man was given the inspiration from the Almighty. It's amazing. <coughs> Study physics sometimes. Get into derivatives and, and realize that a man's <coughs> mind, through the inspiration of the Almighty, <coughs> develops something that makes your head hurt to learn. You can't learn it easy. And this man, it flowed out of him. You say, well, what about this fellow? The man was a Christian, born again. Father, one of the real fathers of real science, empirical science. There's nothing wrong with science. Science is nothing more than a body of truth that's been established. What's wreaking havoc in the world today is science falsely so called. So called sciences who lie to state and win their position. And they cannot demonstrate or prove truth. Now, I've had a good blessing, and you could think about this for a minute. But in my association, I know three saved born-again doctors. I have a son that's an aerospace engineer, a genuine rocket scientist, a son that's a high school biology teacher, all well educated in science and all saved in worshiping God in spirit and truth. But if you would get that news media, you'd think the only people that believe the Bible are mental retards, which shows a very bigoted, maligned world. Now, the father of modern physics was Sir Isaac Newton, born again, saved Christian. And you know what? The scientific world acknowledged that he was one of the greatest geniuses that ever lived. But they despise his Christianity. And they'll say negative things about him because he was a Christian. And I'm going to tell you something. Most of the revelations of science that are established facts that are truths came from two groups of people. Born again Christians and Jews. 
you eliminate the Christians and the Jews, and you got a world of business. That's a fact. You got a world that doesn't know what it's doing. It's back to the uh, dark ages. And most of the science that's being established today is done through computers and living off of the revelations of science from the scientists of the past that were Christians and Jews. They made the breakthroughs. God gave them the wisdom. So I'm going to take you into a little bit of a revelation between your creator God. The Spirit of God dwells somehow in the electromagnetic energy of the creation of the electromagnetic spectrum dealing with dark matter and dark energy and magnetism. Now, I don't have enough knowledge. I just have an understanding of God and some basics in science to give you that. And, oh, if God would only give us about 10 or 15 saved physicists, born again, good minds with right hearts that God could reveal truth to them when we find out things that would, would just tickle our minds. See here? And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, and it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Now, the ignorance of lost men, natural men. Well, the Bible can't be true. Look at here. In the beginning, God creates the light, and then the sun doesn't show up in the day four. What a contradiction. What an ignorant person you are. The first light that God created was cosmic light. It is the electromagnetic spectrum. The sun was created on the fourth day. It's a luminous object that radiates electromagnetic energy. Man and Satan... There are several major points of the electromagnetic spectrum. They are radio waves, microwaves, infrared waves, visible waves, ultraviolet ray waves, X-rays, and gamma rays. They also correspond with the seven eyes of God that you find over in Zechariah that nobody can comment on because they don't believe God and they don't believe the revealed facts. But if you believe the Bible and believe God, you'll get to know the seven eyes, and I've taught you the truth relate to the seven openings in the Lord, which relate to the seven spirits, which relate to the seven candlesticks, which relate to the seven points on the electromagnetic spectrum of light. And by those electromagnetic spectrum, you can see everything in the universe. They build telescopes, electromagnetic telescopes, such as a microwave telescope, infrared telescope, ultraviolet telescopes, gamma ray scopes, to see the universe. That's how God, who dwells in the light, sees all through the light that he created. Revelation 5, 6, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth in all the earth. Now those seven horns, horns in the Bible deal with power, and they're connected. I don't have the understanding of this to go any further. But if you study horns in the Bible, they're, they're a symbol of power. And what is the Lord? The Almighty, the potent, the all-powerful. Now, visible light, and I'll give you a little scientific knowledge tonight. Visible light breaks down into seven different colors, as I gave you before. Uh, violet, no, excuse me. First I gave you electromagnetic spectrum, and then you have the visible light. And the visible light breaks down into seven colors. Violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, and red. Unlike sound waves, this is electromagnetic waves do not require a medium through which to move and can travel across empty space. Hence, God's spirit is also everywhere. The Bible talks of the height and the depth and the breadth and it's eternal. When you start studying the revelations of science in the empirical method and 
study your Bible, you'll soon come to see the hand of the Creator is all over His creation. That's what Newton realized. So electromagnetic waves do not require a medium through which to move and can travel across empty space. The length of the wave can vary from hundreds of yards down to subatomic scales. And so what's the Bible tell you? By his spirit, he hath garnished the heavens, and his hand formed the crooked circuits. Right? God's spirit is the creative power of the universe. The full range of wavelengths is known as electromagnetic spectrum, of which visible light forms only a small part. Despite the observed wave-like character of electromagnetic uh, radiation, it can also behave as if it's composed of tiny particles known as photons. Now, what you're going to find when you start getting into quantum physics and you start looking at subatomic particles, you start seeing abnormal phenomena that represents Bible revelation of supernatural things of God that men were never aware of, but you have all kinds of things that are not the same as you see in our visible world. Phenomena that are biblical. You can have, well, I, I won't even go there because I'm not a physicist, but if you, you can read some books by atheists that will reveal to you what they've discovered in the, in the creation while they look right past the creator. And their blindness to the creator uh, is not going to be excused when the only potent shows up and says, hey, you looked all over my creation and you ignored me because you were proud and full of yourself. And I'm the one that made all this put it into existence. Now, visible light breaks down into seven different colors, as I told you. So the Bible goes on and tells us, the Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. The connection between light and electromagneticism was revealed in the 19th century by physicist James Clerk Maxwell work on electric magnetic fields. Using equations he developed, he found that the speed at which the fields moved through space was exactly the speed of light and concluded that light was a disturbance of these fields traveling in the form of waves. So God tells us in the book of Job, the most ancient book in the world by what way is the light parted which scattereth the east wind upon the earth full knowledge of the electromagnetic spectrum full knowledge of the parting of light in the spectrum your bible was written by the king of kings and lord of lords the almighty creator his equations also showed that other forms of EMR with longer and shorter wavelengths were possible. These were later identified. Maxwell's finding gave rise to the study of electrodynamics according to which EMR consists of oscillating electric and magnetic fields at right angles to one another uh, and to the direction of motion. This explained the wave-like nature of light as observed in many experiments. So God would have us to know God that made the world and all things therein. He made it all. Seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth. He's an eternal spirit that created physics, the matter of physics. Dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshiped with men's hands, as though he had need, uh, that he need anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath to all things. Now, what really rocks the scientists the, the, the unbelieving infidels. What they can't handle, because if you go to Spinoza's God, you'll find that a lot of these scientists do believe in a neutral type of a God, a God of symmetry and order and beauty that you find in 
the universe. That is not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is a God of beauty and symmetry. That's the true God. But the thing that they can't handle is that the creator God, the spirit, the eternal logos, if you would, can manifest himself as a man. And he'll come back as a man. And when you see the man, Christ Jesus, coming back in his glorified body, you'll see God coming back in an ability to communicate with you, an ability to deal with you as a man. That's what they can't handle, the true personal God that you can pray to, the Almighty. And God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is, you say, why is that? Because they can't be free spirits. They're going to be subject to the Father's spirit. Seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in the temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands, as though he had need of anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. That's the creator God. Energy from the sun is crucial to life on earth. Sunlight heats the Earth's surface, which in turn heats the atmosphere and maintaining temperatures suitable for life and driving the planet's weather system. God is so precise. Our Earth revolves around the sun or whichever way, it's whether it's uh, geniocentric or heliocentric. It doesn't matter to me. All that matters to me is I know God made it and it's working his way. And here's the bottom line. Uh, that earth is in a Goldilocks zone. It's not too close. It's not too far right. It's just right. So it gets enough heat and everything works right and the Almighty has developed all the magnificent biosphere and living systems that you see because he is glorious and he is wondrous and he is the Almighty. He is the potentate. This is the God of the Bible that few Christians know. Holy, godly, all-known, omnipotent, all-seeing, omnipresent. So energy from the sun is crucial to life. So Ecclesiastes tells us one generation passes away Another generation coming, but the earth abideth forever. Now, tell all those crazy scientists, all those doomsdayers. Now, isn't that something? We're supposed to be the crazy, nutty doomsdayers, but it's them that's telling you the world's coming to an end. I have never told you, the Bible has told you over and over, the world's forever. The only thing that's coming to an end is this age. And then there's going to be another age. And then there's going to be a thousand-year age. And then we go into the age of ages. But the earth survives. And so here's God giving you the truth. The truth, the creator. One generation pass away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. The sun also arises, and the sun goeth down, and hasteneth to his place where he arose. The wind goeth toward the south, and turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to his circuit. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they turn again. So we have the circle of life. And now you get the evolutionists come in, and they start getting their little lions out there, and they start singing about the circle of life. It's God that made the circle of life. It didn't evolve out of anything. It was a creator God that set up the system that works. And the circle of life goes on until he halts time. And then there's going to be an eternal life that's going to be void of all the sin of this life. And it's going to be a glorious life. As the universe is ever expanding, that shocked the scientists when they discovered the universe, and I'm not going to get into that, is ever expanding because they're expecting a collapse, or and, and they didn't know it's expanding, and it just blew their mind. That's because God's eternal. The universe is going to be eternal. It's going to go out. He's going to roll it up. He's going to send it out again. But uh, we'll get into 
uh, the science of things called inflation, uh, which the Bible says he stretches out the heavens, and people, well, what's this all about? It's the scientists are finding out the work of the creator of God and distancing him. Boy, I wouldn't want to be them. When he deals with us, well, you knew this, this, and this. You saw my handiwork, and you did not acknowledge me. Now, plants use the sun's electromagnetic energy for photosynthesis, the method by which they produce food. Solar energy is converted to chemical energy that powers the process that allows plants to make glucose they need to survive for carbon dioxide and water. The byproduct of this reaction is oxygen, so photosynthesis is responsible for maintaining the planet's oxygen level. And we'll get into all those crazy global warmers, but I ain't going to get into that tonight. Look at God. The chief musician, the psalm of David, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth its handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. You ever get out there, and oh, I'll tell you, if you can ever get to Hawaii, go up on Mauna Kea. Go up there, they have, um, it, it's real dark up there. Uh, you're out, and some, you, it gets real dark, and you look up at the stars, and they're like little gobblers of glowing light, and they're so bright. And you can put telescopes, they have all types of amateur telescope people show up there all the time. And we hit it right, because they had a big, big, uh, expensive telescope, and we were looking through them, and looking at uh, uh, Jupiter, and the moons, and the stars, and Mercury and, uh, and uh, Mars and, uh, it, and uh, Pleiades and Venus and Orion. And it was gorgeous. Uh, I would love to put a house up on Mauna Kea with a full glass ceiling. I would just lay there at night and look at the heavens. What, what, what depth, though? There's a, I remember when I was lost, I'd look up into those heavens when I was young. Uh, the city lights and the local lights were not the bright. You could see a lot of stars. I remember when I was a kid camping out at Boy Scouts. We could go out uh, in the country around here and camp out, and we could see the Milky Way in its full glory. And now you can hardly see it. And um, I'd look up in there, and I'd find it so empty and feel so small. Now that I'm saved, I feel so warm and cozy. I look up and say, oh, Lord, my God, how great thou art. I look up there and say, God, I can't wait to meet you. You have such power and such magnificence. <coughs> what a God. What a Savior. Day unto day utter speech, night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out throughout all the earth. Their woes to the end of the, excuse me, their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set the tabernacle for the sun, <coughs> which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices a strong man to run a race. <clears throat> and you look at that sun, I mean, the, the, the workings of God, blood red sunsets. <coughs> so let's a man know there's a son that died for him. Let's a man know when the sun goes down, he sheds his blood. And then he comes around and rises up again. I am the life and the resurrection, Jesus said. He's going to rise again. Amen, amen. Boy. Now, most forms of technology rely largely on electromagnetic energy. The Industrial Revolution was powered by heat generated uh, by the combustion of fossil fuels, and more recently, solar, ra solar radiation has been used directly to provide clean, renewable power. Modern communications, broadcasting, and internet depend heavily on radio waves and on light channels through fiber optic cables. Laser technology uses light to read from and write to CDs and DVDs. Most of what scientists know about the universe comes from the analysts of EMR, of various wavelengths from distant stars and galaxies. Can't you see that all the technology that's being developed is simply God's creation and the power of the light? Mm. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, that, uh, that light has a lot more to do than just the light of light. It's the light of the universe. That's God. He is also the light of life. 
And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now you get into this thing they're starting to find and discover that's been there. So they're not really discovering it. They just come to realize what God made. Dark matter, dark energy. Look at the scriptures. Look at the scriptures. He setteth an end to darkness and searches out all perfection, the stones of darkness and the shadows of death. Mm. There's the stones of fire. The stones represent usually souls. There's the stones of darkness. More is unknown than is known. We know how much dark energy there is because we know how it affects the universe expansion. Other than that, it's complete mystery. They, they know it's there, but they can't grasp it. They can't perceive it. They can't reveal it. It's like the eternal God. No man has seen God, but he's there. See? But it's an important mystery. It turns out that roughly 68% of the universe is dark energy. Dark matter makes up about 27%. The rest, everything on Earth, everything even observed with all of our instruments, all normal matter adds up to less than 5% of the universe. Come to think of it, maybe it shouldn't be called normal matter at all since it's a small fraction of the universe. And so the scriptures say, and he made darkness pavilion flowings round about him, dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. And you start looking into the universe as an astronomer. Oh, if we had some sage astronomers that could look at the heavens and hear the words of God and come to the truth of his creation. Without another Newton, the revelations of quantum physics, which is the study of of the behavior of matter and energy at the molecular, atomic, nuclear level, and even smaller microscopic levels will not be likened to their creator as they should be. In the early 20th century, it was discovered that the laws that govern macroscopic objects do not function the same as in small realms. And so that's where they're looking for this theory of everything, this unifying theory. And they're, they're putting their hopes on string theory, but I don't think it's going to give them and because the things that happen in, at our level in the larger universe don't coincide with the things that ha happen at the quantum levels. Uh, it gets spooky down. It gets supernatural at the lower levels. Uh, God is working in there, and they don't realize it. Those who study the creation and truth of empirical science will see the hand of the creator all through his creation if their eyes are open to his light, that light of every man. Now, interesting things that take place. There was a Jewish uh, ordinance under Abraham uh, to circumcise a male child. It was always circumcised on the eighth day. And the vitamin K level, the baby, uh, hits its maximum peak. It's the optimum time to do a circumcision. God knew that just astounding and, and if you take a look at the periodic chart uh, you'll find that we are made our, our base is carbon and if you studied your Bible and you find the number of man it's a number of a man 666 and so man is made of carbon which has six six protons six neutrons and six electrons it's number six in the periodic chart the hand of the creator is all over the creation. It just keeps coming up God if you've got eyes to see. But you're dealing with, if, if they're not empirical scientists, if they're imaginary nuts, they cannot see the truth. It's kind of like I told you about my time going over to France to see um, uh, the Notre Dame. I wanted to see the edifice. And I'm looking all over for it. We're trying to find the map, and we're lost in, in Paris, the wife and I. And I asked a policeman, I said, uh, Notre Dame. I'm trying to speak to him, but he can hear me. I probably should have just said Notre Dame. And uh, I said, do you know where it is? And he looks at me and he said, can't you see? <laughs> it's right in front of my face. You know where God is? He's right in front of your face. Can't you see? And 
and what a God. Those who study the creation in truth will see God. All right. He made the darkness his secret place, his pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the sky. Now we change our subject. Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who give us richly all things to enjoy. Now, this is important that you understand the moderation of God that will bring joy to your life. Bible strongly rejects your the human carnal love of money. But wealth's not sin. And having things is not sin. It's important to understand you have the things and not the things have you. That's what God's trying to tell you. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. God is good, and God is not trying to keep you uh, poor as a church member. He's trying to get you, uh, one of your politicians that is a businessman was very honest and talked about the pursuit of his wealth, that it was very bad for the family. And basically, Whatever you can achieve through honest labor, work, entrepreneurship, while balancing your time for God, balancing your time for your family, balancing your time, you should enjoy it. Just don't get out of balance. Money can't buy love. Money can't buy truth. Money can't buy Money can't buy a lot of things that belong to God. The love of money is the root of all evil, not the enjoyment of your wealth accumulated by labor and honoring of the giver of every good thing. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. How many had given a good gift before the child was responsible enough to receive it and have had their children killed or harmed or maimed because it wasn't time. God knows when it's time. The Lord is in charge no matter how many times you mistake gain for godliness. If you are ungodly, you are simply crafty, smooth, slick, Christian opportunity. A heart that is right with God looks to be moderate, not excessive. Now, here's a good prayer for you. It's a prayer I pray all the time. Two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity and lies. If you're a Christian, you should be after God's truth. Today, truth's fallen in the street. The truth shall make you free. He said, I am the way, the truth. God says, thy word is truth. The Bible says, sanctify him through thy truth. Remove fire from me, vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty, don't want to be poor, don't want to be destitute, nor riches, don't want to be rich. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee and say, who is the Lord? That's what Pharaoh said. Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. Food convenient for you. The religious Pharisees were opportunists and always went to excess. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Your life needs to be balanced and moderate with God. You'll have the joy of the Lord. The reason Christians are so miserable today, it's not that a lot of them aren't saved, 
it's they're not balanced. They've made decisions they should have never made. They bought into things they should have never bought into. They're into marital relationships they should have prayed about and asked God before they did it. Because they were driven by their lust and by their desire for gain rather than to find the game plan from God and let things come in his time. For he hath made everything beautiful in his time. The moderate accumulation of wealth over a life of moderation is the biblical norm for God's people. You see here, house and riches are the inheritance of father, and a prudent wife is from the Lord. So you are to be responsible, and you are to accumulate wealth and riches in time through honest ways. Again, the Bible is capitalistic with a heart of compassion. It knows nothing of the theft of socialism or communism and refutes them. Now, verse down here. Cast in thy lot amongst us, thus we have one purse. In the context, it's dealing with criminalistic people. But communists and socialists are criminalistic people because they take and rob from one to give to another in the name of generosity. And some of them are the most ungenerous people going. It's very easy to give away somebody else's money. You're supposed to give of your own to help when you give of your own, you show of your own love and your own care. And you have to first take care of your own and be able to help others. The privilege of giving belongs with the discernment of the giver. He that oppresses the poor to increase his riches, and he that giveth to the rich will surely come to want. Now, that was one of the things they got into with a certain politician because he talks about his billions. I was like, I ain't writing a check. I don't want to come to one. I'm not writing it. I mean, I, 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 if he's the only choice against uh, a socialist, I'm going to vote for him. But I'm not going to write him a check. I mean, imagine this. A guy making 40000 a year writing a check to a guy that's got worth $10 billion. It's kind of crazy. The heart of compassion marks those who are led of the Spirit when there is a true need. When you're a good capitalist, you've earned your income, you have excess, I have showed you all things, how that so labor and you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it's more blessed to give than to receive. When there's a need, we are to help. For whoso hath his world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? Now, you won't get out of that by claiming this wicked, ungodly, despicable empathy. Oh, I feel your pain. What's it profit? What's it profit if you feel somebody's pain? If they need your help, as I said the other day, if you hit your, 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 your thumb with a hammer, don't tell me how you feel my pain. Help Get some ice. <laughs> Help relieve the pain. Show some compassion. So Paul finishes in his capitalistic doctrine. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Isn't that amazing that this traveling evangelist who had the sign gifts, who God wrought miracles by, spent most of his ministry working. You know, it was ironic when I went into the ministry. The first 15 years that I was in the ministry, I worked a full-time job plus pastor. And I had, I had Christians criticizing me, saying that I was wicked, and I had no faith because I was working. And I used to say, hmm, must be I'm like the Apostle Paul. Must be. You don't know if I don't 
maybe some people going to Which is what Paul was through most of his ministry. Interesting. Interesting. Now, if you have a church that can support you, that's wonderful. And uh, a minister that can spend full time in the ministry, that's wonderful. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm just giving you a revelation of reality that you find in the scriptures that's ignored today and criticized. then who's reading the Bible? Who's seeing what God's doing with people? We're in a great fallen world and there's a famine. A famine in the land of hearing the word of God. Friend, if you want to hear the word of God, you want the truth, this is the church to come to. We don't have a lot of other things to offer you, but we got the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. We've got God's word. And we teach God's word. We're not here to impress people. We're here to please the Lord. God bless. Come and visit with us sometime.